Well, good morning. It's good to be on with you on this uh, beautiful Monday morning. It is a little bit warmer outside today. I don't know if you were out this morning, but uh, we're definitely in the midst of summer. Um, was kept hoping that there'd be some sort of rainstorm happening over the weekend, but we didn't get anything. I don't know if you did, but uh, we certainly did not, which just made it a little bit hot and muggy. And uh, I, I don't actually mind July if it's raining and monsooning, but when it's not raining and monsooning, then it gets really hot and muggy and that's no fun. So anyway, welcome to you uh, this morning. This is being recorded previous to eight o'clock. So this is... Um, it's uh, actually my time. It's like 6.30 or something like that. Um, and I did, uh, I did get a lot of comments from all of you about uh, kind of how to uh, move the Bible study, talk about the Bible study. And um, what, you know, one of the things is, is that I really enjoy being live. I don't know why that is, but um, when I'm talking, it, it, uh, it's difficult when I'm talking to you knowing that there's nobody listening right now. <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of weird. But um, but it's not, I mean, that's not, that's not that big of a deal. Um, I, I'm going to kind of still continue to uh, uh, process all this and, and hopefully, you know, within the next two or three days, I'll give you an all answer of how we're going to move forward. Um, today is the opening day of school. So I am planning to be there at the school right at eight o'clock to say hi to all the kids as they come in. Um, and uh, we'll just have to keep playing it by ear every day. Um, as we move forward because every day is a new day and um, you know the school is a great blessing I don't know um, if you know but uh, I started attending a Lutheran school in my junior high years and uh, it was such a profound blessing in my life uh, I I believe that um, that Christian education is the finest education you can possibly get because uh, it ties in two worlds. It ties in the world of knowledge uh, with the world of faith. And um, if you don't tie those two worlds together, um, you know, you, you, can, you can end up uh, you, you putting your faith, I guess, in, in, the wrong, in the things that will fail you in life, I guess, is maybe the best way to say it. And uh, one of the great things about a Christian education is that it helps you tie the two together. Now, you don't have to go to a Obviously, don't have to go to a Christian school to tie those two things together. But for whatever reason, um, in my previous life, uh, before before I went to that school, I I hadn't made the connection that strong. So the fact that I was able to to go to a, uh, a Lutheran school was just very very profound. It had a huge profound impact on my life. So, um, <laughs> so that that's uh, one of the you know main blessings that I see of Christ Lutheran Vale Church is that we are, you know, we do have a school and we're able to tie those two things together in people's lives. So today's the opening day. We pray for their school, that, it, uh, that it's safe, uh, that they all watch out for each other. It's a wonderful time. Um, we pray for all the teachers, <laughs> lots of them this year, um, working very, very hard to try to keep the school, uh, you know, under its mission and that sort of thing. So and it, it, is, uh, it is a challenging time right now because of uh, COVID. Um, it is, it is uh, uh, you know, trying to navigate the basic needs of kids with the basic needs of safety and the basic needs of teachers and the basic needs of this church and trying to figure all that out and, you know, move in a way that's flexible and fluid and yet safe and all that is just really quite a challenge. So I applaud all of the people that have worked so hard over the summer to get to this point. Um, they just did a phenomenally good job. So, but do keep them in your prayers. Keep all of them in your prayers. Uh, let's see, what else? There are no birthdays today. I think we've got one tomorrow, um, but there are none today. So we are not going to sing happy birthday. Actually, we haven't sung happy birthday yet, have we? Um, coronavirus cases in Arizona still continue to go down. So I'm sure at some point, uh, you know, that'll be good news touted by everybody. Um, but there could be second or third waves. So, you know, it'd be cautiously optimistic news. Uh, so I think what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and dig right into the story of Abraham. Now, we read the story of Abraham on Friday. We read through the whole thing. And just to recap, uh, Abraham uh, was told by God he'd be a father of a great nation. After many years, Abraham doesn't see God coming through on this promise, so he uh, has a child with Hagar, 
And God said, no, that wasn't the promise. It was through Sarah. So he makes Sarah pregnant. They have a child. And now Abraham has had this huge blessing for 13 years of having this child, Isaac, whom he loves very much. I mean, Abraham's older. He's wealthy. I mean, he's He's kind of like one of these Hollywood stars, you know, that um, waits really, really late in life to have a child and almost becomes like a grandfather. I mean, without the stresses of, I mean, one of the challenges of having children at a very, very young age is that, uh, you know, you're, you're still trying to figure out life yourself and then you throw a child into the mix. That can be very, very difficult. Um, but if you have a child older in life and you're, you know, you're financially set, you know, everything is set for you. You really can almost be like a grandchild to this child and just enjoy the child uh, immensely, which is kind of how I picture Abraham. He was older in life, uh, and so he has this child and uh, basically has, has been able to enjoy the later years of his life of having this wonderful child. Uh, he still has his health, uh, as near as we can tell, and so he's able to uh, love uh, Isaac uh, immensely. And then God calls Abraham to do the unthinkable. He calls him one day and he says, uh, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. And um, this, is, this is just a horrible, horrible, there is no way uh, that this ends well. Um, and I think... We talked about this a little bit on Friday, but as um, if if Abraham does this, uh, th there is no way that this ends well. We know the end of the story, and the end of the story is that Abraham goes up to the mountain getting ready to sacrifice Isaac, and God says, wait, no, this was just a test of your faith. Uh, here's a ram in the thicket, go ahead and grab the ram, sacrifice that itself, and Isaac continues to live. But up until that point, as near as we can tell by any indication, uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. There is absolutely no question he was going to do that. He took the wood, he left the servants, he just took Isaac by himself, he was going to be faithful, and he was going to sacrifice Isaac. Now, I, I touched on this a little bit on Friday, but this story should terrify us a little bit because, um, well, and uh, one of the Danish philosophers of the 1800s is a guy named Soren Kierkegaard, and he uh, is the considered to be the father of existentialism, and I do not consider myself to be a philosopher at all. I, um, I, I've known many people that study philosophy, they have degrees in philosophy, they understand all the different isms of philosophy. I am not one of those people. I, I read books and they're very, very hard for me. And one of the books I've read was this book by Soren Kierkegaard called Fear and Trembling, which is about the story of Abraham. And I can't even begin to touch the surface of uh, you know what this means for philosophy and that sort of thing. But in the book, um, uh, Kierkegaard uh, talks about four different ways that the ride home goes. And um, I guess, it, just think about it. Uh, the, the, the son, Isaac, has to understand that his father was about to kill him. So um, Isaac has a, has a couple choices. He can be angry at his father for following God's will and, you know, loving loving God or, you know, uh, uh, following God more than he's going to follow the law of God, which is to love your child. Um, or Isaac loses faith in God altogether because why would God want him, you know, why would God want to kill him? Um, if, if uh, you know, if this story gets out, you know, about what happens, if the whole society could lose faith in Abraham. I mean, lots of people lose faith in a lot of different things. And it all stems from the fact that in this story, Abraham doesn't appear to get any benefit whatsoever by sacrificing Isaac. That's probably the, the most stark realization of this story, is that God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, 
but it's there's no reason behind it. Now, if there's a reason behind it, then we go into a whole different realm of understanding of this story. For example, um, if God had told Abraham, you have to sacrifice Isaac because then he is the perfect sacrifice for the whole world, or you have to sac sacrifice Isaac as an example of something or whatever, but there's some good that comes out of it, um, then everybody would kind of shake their head and say, yes, this is, this is horrible that he had to sacrifice Isaac, but it was for a greater good. Um, and in, in the, the, you know, the realm of, of the world that we live in, we would call that, and actually I think Kierkegaard calls that the tragic hero, right? The, the person who kind of takes upon his shoulders this realm of doing something very difficult, but it's for the greater good of mankind. Um, and, and we have tragic heroes all the time. Uh, who are willing to sacrifice something for the greater good of, I mean, uh, look at uh, Spock, right, in uh, the world's greatest movie, well, maybe the second or third greatest movie, The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, where, where Spock basically takes his own life, um, but it is for the greater good, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. Uh, and so Spock takes his life. And we get tears to our eyes watching this because it is necessary. We realize that the trade-off of Spock taking his own life is necessary because he saves everybody on the Starship Enterprise. But in the story of Abraham, as near as we can tell, the way it's constituted, uh, God has no other meaning behind the taking of Isaac's life other than God just simply demands it. And and. And Abraham doesn't, as he's walking up Moriah with his son, he doesn't see any benefit in it at all. I mean, all he sees is negatives. Uh, he's going to go up. He's going to sacrifice Isaac. He's going to come back down the mountain. The servants are going to say, where is Isaac? He has two choices. He can lie and say, well, an animal took him. Or he could tell the truth uh, and the servants would be aghast. He goes back into town where he's well-respected and people love him and he's the father of a great nation of people. Uh, and they say, where's Isaac? And he has two choices. He can lie and say, well, an animal took him or he can say, I sacrificed him on an altar. And they say, why did you do that? Because God told me to. Why did God tell you? I have no idea. He's God. I don't understand. Um, I mean, this, this is the... Um, this is the, the whole point of the story of Abraham, right? Is that there's no benefit to mankind. There's no benefit to the greater good. There's not even any benefit to Abraham. Abraham loses everything by following this. Um, he has every, as near as he can tell, he's going to go up to the mountain. He's going to sacrifice Isaac. He's going to lose Isaac. He's going to lose the promise of God to be a great nation. Unless he goes and finds Ishmael and Hagar. He's going to lose the respect of the community. He's going to lose the love of his life, the, the mother. I mean, think of, think of Sarah, who's waited all these years to have Isaac, and now you know Isaac is sacrificed. I mean, all of the, nobody wins in this situation uh, at all. Uh, the only one that wins, I guess, is God, because he gets Abraham tested and uh, you know, can play you know, these little games of, of testing you know, God ends up looking like, uh, in the story, God looks like a, a really bad guy, right? I mean, like a super huge bad guy. Now, Abraham could, I suppose, trust that God's going to provide another child, but will Abraham have enough hope in his life to go through that again? Or will he turn his back on God and say, fine, I'm done? You know, you, you promised me something, it didn't come through, didn't come through, and finally you came through, but then you told me to sacrifice the child. I'm done with you. I mean, faith can only go so far before it gets to a breaking point where we finally say, I'm done. And uh, would Abraham get to that point? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, we simply don't know because when he gets up to the top of the mountain, God re you know, points out to Abraham that this was just a test of faith. Um, and you know, now there's a ram in the thicket. And, and, and that really is the, the whole a crux of the story is that God tests Abraham's faith in a way that he's probably not tested any of us. 
um, accept that, um, that's when faith gets really, really, really tough, is when we don't see any reasoning behind the will of God. When God does something in our life and we look at it from every which angle we could possibly look at it, and we just don't see any greater good whatsoever for God doing what he did. Um, you see this uh, oftentimes when a child dies or you see this when there's a great tragedy like an earthquake or a hurricane or something. And we try to justify in our heads that there must be, you know, well, you know, the child could have grown up and something worse could have happened or, you know, the hurricane did this and there was a lot of good that came out of it. But a lot of times um, we as human beings don't see the good that comes from some of the horrible, tragic things that we know that God allows in life. And that really is the story of Abraham. And that's why Abraham's considered the father of faith, because he, he knew without a shadow of a doubt that he had to follow God. No question he had to follow God, but he didn't see any good reason behind it. And nobody else would have seen a good reason behind it either. And yet Abraham remains faithful. And because of that, he's considered the father of faith. Um, and so the implication in our life is multiple. I guess the first one is just that when difficult things happen in our life and we don't see any reasoning behind it, um, we want to turn it into a story of a tragic hero. We want to we turn it into, well, God had a greater plan or, uh, you know, we know in... And scripture says all things work for good for those who love God or are called according to his purpose. So we know deep down that God has a purpose for everything and we can cling to that. Um, but the deeper faith, the deeper level of faith is to not even dwell on what is the greater purpose, but just accept God for what he's done or not done and continue to cling to faith even in the midst of things that just don't make any sense. Um, and that truly is, if, if you are able to do that, uh, and actually this is Kierkegaard's whole point of his book, I believe, is that if you can make that leap of faith, he calls it the night of faith, uh, not a N-I-G-H-T, but a K-N-I-G-H-T, basically a chivalrous person who is able to maintain faith and move forward and be a knight of faith in the midst of a condition that makes no sense, but you still are able to cling to God, you still are able to have a relationship with God, you're still able to love God, you're still able to know that God loves you even in the midst of horrible tragedy. And when you are able to do that, you're called the knight of faith. Um, and he sees, uh, Kierkegaard sees Abraham as a knight of faith. And what we typically have a tendency to do as Christians is to try to find the greater meaning behind it so that, um, so that, you know, we can turn it into the tragic hero, right? That yes, it was a horrible thing that happened, but a greater good happened because of it. And because a greater good happened because of it, it all works out in the end. And that is typically um, a lot of ways that most religions and a lot of even Christians try to justify all the evil that happens in the world. Um, but our finite, no matter how hard you try, our finite man, mind cannot comprehend why some things happen. And sometimes we just have to resign ourselves. You know, the uh, infinite resignation, uh, I think as Kierkegaard says, we have to resign ourselves to the fact that God is God and he calls us to faith. And that is even at the time when, um, when it doesn't make any sense to us. And if you can do that, if you can make that leap from ultimate resignation to a night of faith, uh, that is the ultimate, I guess, good, or that's the ultimate sign of faith, uh, is to be able to do that and to not lose your faith. Um, so that is kind of, that, uh, I, I hope I'm making this clear. I, it, is, um, it is one of those stories that when you stop and you think about it, it really makes you think. Um, because as far as we can tell, Abraham had every intention to do it. And there was, as far as we can tell, there was no good that would have come from him doing it. And yet Abraham remains faithful. And that is just, that is huge, which is why he's the father of faith. 
Now, because he was faithful uh, and because God finally saved him at the end, does Abraham then become a tragic hero or does he become just the father of faith? And I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I do know that um, there is a lot of good that comes out of the fact that God does not make Abraham have to sacrifice Isaac. Uh, God um, obviously then is able to fulfill his promise. He's able to test Abraham and he knows Abraham's faith. Abraham becomes an example of faith, uh, not only for the entire Old Testament, for the entire New Testament. Um, he, he is an example of how uh, we should follow God to the end, uh, even when it doesn't make sense because God will work things for good, for all those who love him or are called according to his purpose. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff that comes out of it. Um, and so that's good too. And, um, you know, on, an, on another level, I guess you could say that um, the fact that God saves Isaac from human sacrifice uh, means that the whole entire Judeo-Christian Western culture, the whole 54% of the world that follows Abraham does not believe in child sacrifices or human sacrifices at all. I mean, that's huge. Um, if you look at the history of Christianity, well, look, Judaism or Christianity, well, particularly Christianity, uh, when they started exploring out of Western Europe and going to different cultures and finding new cultures, they would let that culture pretty much remain as it was. Uh, they, But the one thing that they could not allow a culture to do would be human sacrifice. And um, the reason why they would never let uh, human sacrifice is because of, because of Abraham and Isaac, right? Human sacrifice is wrong. Uh, that's what separates Abrahamic religions from all the other religions or paganism is that, the, that they don't sacrifice humans. And why do the pagan religions sacrifice humans? Well, it's it's because at some point along the line, somebody has to pay for the meanness of God, right? In the pagan religions, um, let's say it doesn't rain for two years or three years and all the crops are failing and all the people are dying. Someone has to pay for that. Someone has to uh, make amends. Someone has to show uh, God that you love him you know, I have to make that trade-off, you know, the, the night of in, infinite resignation, right? Somebody has to make the trade-off between I'm going to do this act, God, and then you're going to bring rain and harvest and, you know, reduce the famine and all that stuff that's happening in the land. And the ultimate, it, the ultimate sacrifice that anybody could ever make, I mean, you can give goods, you can give, um, you know, you, there's all, you can do rain dances, uh, you can do anything you want to to try to appease God, but the ultimate sacrifice to appease God, uh, and this would be in paganism, the worst thing you could ever, ever possibly do would be to take another human life. And especially maybe like a young human life, a beautiful human life, like the perfect human life. I mean, what? There is no worse sacrifice that humankind can make than to sacrifice another human. I mean, that is the ultimate sacrifice. There is nothing greater. Uh, and so paganism, if they really, 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 really want to show that they, you know, want to make the ultimate sacrifice to God, then they sacrifice, uh, you know, a young virgin or something like that, throw her into the volcano. That's the biggest sacrifice there is. And in Christianity, Judaism, even Islam, th that sacrifice is never necessary because in the Old Testament, God proved that human sacrifice was not necessary. Uh, and in the New Testament, Jesus becomes the perfect human sacrifice to uh, overshadow every other sacrifice ever given by mankind to God to prove how much, you know, to make that amends between humankind and God. It always comes down to, to Jesus. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. There is none other. So... I guess, in a sense, that is, that is the story of Abraham. Um, and Abraham, even if, even if you are not, I mean, this is kind of wild, but even if you are not a follower of Judaism, Islam, Christianity, the fact that this story exists in the Bible and that Abraham was willing to do that, and Abraham was willing to change uh, 
from um, human sacrifice to no human sacrifice. That is, that is a huge benefit to mankind. I mean, just on the surface of itself, that human sacrifice is not necessary. And even if you don't believe in Jesus as the perfect human sacrifice, the fact that he came and that we as Christians believe that he is the perfect human sacrifice and we don't allow human sacrifice. I mean, Jesus' life, even on a philosophical level, did so much for mankind. Uh, but the biggest and chief among them is that he became the human, the perfect human sacrifice that, that negates all the bad that, that um, we perceive that, that God could be doing in the world. Um, and so therefore you have two choices. You can, you can look at, um, at the world around you and say, there is no God because of all the evil things that are happening in the world. Or you can look at the world around you and say, there's been an atonement for humankind and the world for all the bad things and it happened in Jesus. And because Jesus atoned for all the bad stuff, then nothing worse can happen um, because the world will be redeemed uh, and in the last day recreated and all things will work for good. So all of it does tie back into Abraham and uh, Abraham is the, is the father of faith. And um, I, think, I think we'll leave Abraham there. Um, I thought about maybe doing one more look at all the New Testament references to Abraham, but they kind of just reinforce um, the, the Christian narrative, um, which at this point still uh, is yet to come. So um, I guess we'll probably leave it there. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I pray God's richest blessings on your day. Um, would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, thank you for the blessings of this day. Uh, pray that you would continue to um, guide us. Thank you for the example of the faith of Abraham. Uh, may we uh, have a faith as strong through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so thanks for joining me. Uh, God's richest blessings on your day. Um, and uh, we will see you later. Take care, bye.